Okay. Uh, so let us start today. So today is lecture number two. We are in chapter one. And in the chapter one, we sort of provided a motivation for studying economics of organization and provided some insight into why economics of organization is an important subject area in economics because it can help us to understand the complex uh, decisions that a firm makes in, actual, uh, in the actual economy. So uh, we have abandoned the conventional mindless uh, view of a firm and we are going to start treating our firm as a very dynamic organization that uh, takes care uh, that you know you know considers both short run profit maximization with long run stability and market share a firm that will be investing in research and development a firm that will try to address the issue of competition in a market a firm that will also try to uh, you know you know, see its role in the society as an important aspect of its production decisions. So our our firm will actually be more human than we have usually thought of as a firm. Um, we stopped in this particular slide last time by just exposing the kind of dynamic environment that our firms are in. Because a firm is at the heart of an economy. Because when you think of a firm, the production unit of an economy, that firm gets interaction from these four or you know, six different sources or sides of the economy. A firm simultaneously coordinates with the suppliers because they buy resources from them. The firm also needs to communicate with the investors who are going to provide the firm with the capital. A firm will definitely need to have a good communication with the management body of the firm because the management body will control many aspects of, our, of the firm's production decisions. As we also mentioned that a management, the idea of managing a firm has really expanded in recent times by, under, by looking at the fact that management not only now involves the production decisions but also other decisions that a firm makes, like their advertisement decisions, uh, their marketing decisions, these are also part of the management body, right? So when you think about a firm like that, by the way, a firm also needs to have a good communication with the employees who are working for the firm. A firm needs to really take care of their well-being, provide them with kind of health insurance and so on. So, Customers are obviously a critical element of a firm's decision making because they are the buyers and finally the society. Now the society is an intrinsic part of a firm's decision making process. There are two reasons why a firm needs to be aware of the societal needs. First of all, they are, they are forced to think about these things because by the government. Government will undertake many different policies that will force the firms to think about the society more than they want to, like how much air pollution they are causing, uh, you know, what kind of quality of goods they are providing for the society, and so on. So, in the last class, we also provided an informal discussion as why a firm should be concerned about the society that it is serving, right? Because if a firm can project an image that it is socially conscious by undertaking or investing in many philanthropic activities, a firm might actually be able to secure a larger market share in the long run. So caring about for the society is not an isolated decision that a firm makes. It's part of their overall objective of trying to maximize their profit, trying to maximize their market share. Okay, so today our new discussion will start obviously with the most the, the most basic concept about a firm, which is the profit. Profit, as we always have argued, is the main engine of a firm. It's the guiding force. 
and we need to understand how profits are calculated and how profits are measured by a firm in economics because the way economics calculates and measures profit is different from the way other business disciplines measures and calculates profit. Now, in order to highlight that fact, we clear uh, from the starting point, we distinguish between two kinds of profit. One is what we call a business profit and the other one is what we call an economic profit. This should be just a review of all your previous economic courses. Business profit, or sometimes it is called accounting profit, only reflects the explicit cost and the explicit revenue. Business profit or the accounting profit is the difference between total revenue and the total explicit cost of a firm. What do we mean by explicit cost? Explicit costs are all sort of out-of-pocket expenditures of a firm, like the cost that they incur when they buy raw materials, the cost that they incur when they pay wages to their workers, the cost that they pay when they buy a piece of land. Now, on the other hand, economic co profit, which we are going to be talking about, uh, you know, is kind of different from the accounting profit in several aspects. The most important one is that our economic profit will have a measurement of opportunity cost when costs are calculated as part of the profit calculation. Profit, remember, is the difference between total revenue and total cost. The way accounting or business disciplines calculate cost is by only considering the explicit cost. In economics, costs are also included in terms of the implicit cost or the opportunity cost of an activity. So our economic cost will have both implicit cost and explicit cost. Our business cost will only have explicit cost. This distinction makes our economic profit and our business profit quite different. Now, one of the, one of the most, one of the largest component of this so-called opportunity cost or the implicit cost is the cost of borrowing by a firm because a firm regularly borrows from investors to invest on capital and other kind of expenditures. Imagine, uh, imagine a situation where a saver who is saving money in the economy has two options, either to lend some money to a firm which can take that money and invest and increase their production, or the same saver could put that money in some other opportunities, like buy a stock or a bond or buy government bonds or buy dollar or whatever. That decision-making process that our saver or our consumer goes through really sheds light into how important opportunity cost is. Now, whenever a firm is using the money that it raised from their investors, that money or resources have opportunity cost. Why? Because the investors could have readily use that money to invest in some other economic activities like buying a piece of stock. So when a firm is trying to, or in some extreme cases, a firm can raise its own capital, right? Like the owner could really inherit money from their parents. Like the Walton is a classic example of that, right? Most of the richest people in the world actually have inherited wealth rather than, you know, the wealth that they created. So they could have used that money from someone else and that money also has an opportunity cost because that money could also be, held, be used somewhere else. Once this money is used in the firm's production process, that cost, that opportunity cost has to be added to the cost of production. The simplest way to include that cost of production is by calculating something called uh, nominal return or uh, to be more fancy, risk adjusted normal return. Risk adjusted normal return is the interest rate that a saver could have earned by investing that money somewhere else. Usually, it's the nominal interest rate that 
usually found in the stock market or in a, or in a money market. So let us now think about what we are talking about. For a firm, they have explicit cost like the cost of wages, the cost of raw materials, the cost of the piece of land they are using, the cost to the managers. On top of that, our firm also has a cost that it has to think about when it is calculating its cost. Is the, it is the cost that it is, it is the interest rate that it is actually foregoing by investing that money in the firm. Because the same money which is acting as the capital for a firm could have been just put in a bank and you could have earned easy interest rate on that. Are we all clear on that? Once you are undertaking the production decision, you are giving up that interest rate. And that interest rate is indeed your opportunity cost and should be part of your cost calculation when you are calculating economic profit. This is very, very important because in most of the cases, if you look at the actual uh, you know, business projections or the annual report by any large firm, what they really report is their business or economic profit. There is virtually no way you can actually calculate the economic profit of a firm. Why? Because in most of the cases, the capital that the firm uses are not really well defined because capital is, is like money, right? You really don't know where that money is coming from. It could be coming from a foreign country, but all money is the same, right? Are we, did, that was a joke, but do you understand <laughs> that? So it's like you cannot distinguish between what is what, right? So a firm can never really calculate the opportunity cost of the of the uh, you know investment resources that they are putting in the money. So sometimes uh, in back in the old days when I was an undergraduate student, we used to call that normal return as the cost of capital because it made more sense that when you are using a capital, that capital also has a cost. And that cost is not the explicit cost, but the opportunity cost. Make sense? Okay, so if we have that, then our economic profit is different than our economic uh, business profit, and we, we have to be wary about that. Another thing that makes the discussion of economic profit and business profit is that business profits vary widely. Okay? Um, uh, you know, the variability of business profit could be due to various factors. Some of the factors are obvious, like the size of the firm, like small firms make less profit than large firms, or it could be the other way around, we really don't know. Um, it could be the geographical position of a firm, right? You know, firms, the same firm uh, in one city makes more profit than the same firm in a different city, right? Uh, you can think about McDonald's. Not all McDonald's make the same amount of revenue every every day, right? If your McDonald's is in a crowded city, in a where in a good location, probably they are earning a higher profit. We all understand that, right? So these are some of the obvious reasons why business profits may vary. But we want to understand more deep issues that are associated with this variability. And we want to understand that from a theoretical perspective before going into actual data. Tomorrow, in addition to some, you know, finalizing the syllabus, I will also uh, share with you some resources that we are going to be using for this course, which is mainly data. So what I'll do, I will create a, by the way, the uh, course space for this particular course is now available in Blackboard. You should, if you go to Blackboard now, you should, should, be, you should see this course uh, you know, in your Blackboard course list. Uh, we are going to be using that particular space uh, extensively. In that space, I will upload a folder where I will, uh, you know, compile the data that we are going to be using to solve some of the economic problems. Uh, that will be part of your uh, homework. That will be also part of your in-class problem set. Okay. Um, there are several competing economic theories that explain why economic profit or uh, profits vary among different firms. So this is a very pedagogical, very basic understanding of why different firms make 
different kind of profit. Some of this first set of theories, which are very straightforward, although their name sounds kind of foreign, is called disequilibrium profit theories. I really don't know why they are called disequilibrium theories, but their explanation is very, very simple. Let's read that. There are two explanations by this theory that explains why profit varies among different firms. The first one is unexpected revenue growth. What does that mean? Unplanned growth. How can that happen? Uh, somehow in the economy, somebody gains more disposable income than. Right. It could be it could be a combination of various factors. It could be uh, you know change in the so the way we want to show uh, talk about this is it could be <coughs> excuse me <coughs> part of the you know you know the reason why we can have an unexpected revenue growth is when there are unexpected changes in the demand side. That changes could be as a result of various factors. It could be that you know suddenly income has gone up. Government probably has uh, provided some kind of policy that has raised disposable income. Very right. Um, it could be that suddenly people uh, start buying more of that good. That could also happen, right? That would be an unexpected revenue growth. That the firms really did not plan on selling, uh, you know, a certain amount of good, but their product became so popular that they are now selling more, and this revenue growth is unexpected. Make sense? Does it work the opposite way? It, it can, definitely. Definitely does. I mean, uh, automobile industry is a classic example of, of, uh, of an industry where you actually don't see unexpected revenue grow, but you actually see unexpected revenue fall. Right? What results in an unexpected revenue fall? What do you think? Yeah. A decrease in demand, I guess, or so. The gas change, the gas problem that happened, and people weren't uh, like truck sales went down, or larger car sales went down because people wanted small. Well, you, you're right. This this could explain why an unexpected revenue fall could happen. My question was that: What is the outcome of that? What happens when there is a unexpected revenue fall? Companies lose money and have ex extra inventory. Very good. That's the word I want. I was actually expecting. So what you have as a result of an unexpected revenue fall is a rise in unexpected inventory. Something that I'm sure your macroeconomics courses have talked about. And this unplanned or uh, inventory was a key element in explaining macroeconomic equilibrium. So it can result from that. Um, so this was all related to demand side because demand sides are going to influence uh, whether there is an unexpected revenue growth or unexpected revenue fall, but then there is the other side of the story. So revenue, unexpected revenue changes could make your profit variable, but unexpected changes in cost could also make your revenue variable. And to be very honest with you, most of the firms are worried more about the second one than the first one. Why? Let's just have an intuitive answer to that. Why would firms be more worried about the second one than the first one? Easier to control. Very good answer. That's a, you know, the, I'm very, I was just talking with my departmental chairman and I was telling him how excited I am to be, like, be able to teach this course with people who, know, who have sufficient amount of background to take this course. This is very, very important. This was a very good answer. Now, when you think about costs, and how much it costs you to produce something, and how much you produce and how much you can sell, if you think about these two sides, we usually think that it is easier for a firm to control their cost rather than how much they can produce, right? Or how much they can sell. In reality, it's actually the other way around. Because firms have become extremely sophisticated in recent times where they can now have really good market forecast where they can literally predict how much they can sell. But what is their cost is subject to uncertainty because part of the factors that affect the cost of production for a firm is beyond their control. 
like a natural disaster, right? Like a, a you know a political unrest in the Middle East, right? And you cannot control that, right? Imagine what is happening to Texas right now, right? So the second reason why profits would be very much variable is because there are swings in unexpected swings in the costs. Sometimes costs go up, sometimes costs go down, and most of the times they are unexpected. In either case, by the way, in either case, whenever you have your revenue stream is unexpected or your cost structure is un uh, unexpected, your profits are going to be variable. So this is pretty much straightforward, right? The next one, the next theory that tries to explain this profit variability, I think is interesting. And I, we want to spend some time on this. This is, this is kind of fascinating. The theory is called compensatory profit theories. Okay? This is new generation profit theory, by the way, developed over the last 10 to 15 years. They are very contemporary and they argue these are combination of theories, mainly developed by people from New York University and Stanford. They argue that profits accrue to firms that are better, faster, or cheaper than the competition. Okay? So their argument is a little bit interesting and different. They are saying that uh, when you think about the disequilibrium profit theories, we are talking about unexpected revenue changes. We are talking about unexpected cost changes. These are things that not only affect one firm, but it affects everyone. If my cost of production increases, because there is a, a political unrest in, in the Middle East and the price of oil has gone up, it is also affecting my competitors. Are we all clear on that? And, that's, and this kind of... Uh, profit variability is kind of boring, right? Because everyone is facing the same kind of problem. Are we all clear on that? What is interesting is when part of the variability is internalized by the firm. And the firm can internalize this variability by making themselves better, faster, more efficient than their competitors. Imagine the two producers are producing the same product and there is a deadline and there is a market where buyers are waiting. Anyone, uh, now the firm that can run faster can be able to sell the product faster and quicker than the other one, right? It's just a joke, but I think the, uh, the, the picture, you know, is, is quite convenient uh, and, and relevant for this kind of discussion. And that's exactly how the paper was written. It was about a tournament where Two people are running, and you know they are producers. They are producing uh, like uh, some kind of cheese, and this was an old European story where you know uh, this is like a festival where uh, you know they are the customers lie on a on one side of the uh, field, and you make cheese. Have you seen making how cheeses are being made? Have you has anyone seen how cheeses uh, can be made like you know the manual way? They have the, it's just a very primitive process. But you can make cheese and when you make cheese, you take the cheese and you run to your customers, right? The faster you run, the more you can sell. Makes sense, right? Okay? The more, comp uh, so you, you can be faster. Obviously, if you are better than your customer, your competitors, you are going to be able to capture a, a larger market share. Out of these three factors that can create this compensatory profit theory, I think the third, last one is the most important one. If you are a firm that can find the factors that you are using in your production process, and you find that at a cheaper price than your competitors, that obviously gives you an edge. So in the last class, we talked about some firms being able to tap into a, lot, uh, a cheaper labor market can obviously make a large profit gain. Apple is a, Apple is a cl classic example of that, right? Right? Levi's is an example like that. If you think about 
Samsung versus Apple, you know, you would wonder, you know, sometimes, you know, I wonder, I mean, why do they, uh, they have, you know, products which are, uh, you know, evenly priced, right? Their, their, their cost of production are very different, right? Apple has a huge, uh, you know, outsourcing uh, economic activity in China where the labor, labor cost is probably the, one of the cheapest in the world. Samsung haven't been able to do that, by the way. They are trying to do that. They also have, uh, anyway. So, if you can somehow find, be, become cheaper than your competitors, you know, you're done, right? You can definitely get a higher, uh, you know, profit level compared to your competitors. So, there will be a larger degree of variability between uh, profit among different firms. So, these are, you know, so what if, I, if you want to take an overview of these two competing theories, the disequilibrium profit theories are sort of macro explanation <coughs> as to how profit variability can occur and compensatory profit theories are sort of like a micro exam explanation as how profits can be variable and we would be very interested in both more interested in the compensatory profit theories how can firms make themselves better how can firms be faster than their competitors how can a firm make some good, the same good that their competitors are producing at a cheaper price? Okay, um, so that's profit. Um, another important element that you know probably was would, would not have been discussed if this course was taught even ten years ago is to increasingly understand uh, the uh, is to understand the increasingly important role of a firm or a business in an economy okay or in a society okay um, in the last class we sort of raised this very uh, uh, basic pedagogical question as to why firms exist uh, you know from the at the uh, you know beginning it seemed like a silly question because firms exist because they exist uh, because people need goods, because you know, people need to buy stuff, so firms exist. This goes back to a very, uh, very early statement that one of my favorite economists made, who was actually not an economist. I'm going to write that statement, because we are going to come back and talk about it in some time. My handwriting is not good. So this guy... His name is John Baptist Say, a British non-economist, he was a philosopher, he was a preacher by the way. He came up with this idea that supply creates its own demand. I think one of the, one, one of the few uh, not one of the few. I think most of the early this was this was in 1600. So back then there was nothing called economics. So this uh, uh, you know man of this religious person made this amazingly accurate uh, you know sort of perception about the world that supply creates his own demand. Is that true? In your in, throughout all your economics courses, you have been taught that economic, you know, economic demand and economic supply are separate entity, right? The factors that affect demand are independent of the factors that affect supply. Supply is made by firms, demand is made by households. And we have made very, very conscious effort to distinguish the role of the consumer and the role of the producer in a market. This guy made a statement which seems like these two are connected. Demand and supply are connected. It's very difficult to put that in a very, in an undergraduate level macroeconomic model, by the way. But do we understand this from a philosophical perspective? When I taught this course, uh, or some variation of this course, to uh, people living in other countries where some of the goods that you use on an everyday basis are not used, this idea became really, really common, right? So the example that I used to provide is paper towels. Paper towels. Or toilet papers. Right? You cannot imagine your life without it. 
Paper towels did not exist even 50 years ago. You can go back. The first brand of paper towels came out probably in the 60s. Before that, there was none, right? Are we all clear on the importance of this statement? That there was a time when people really did not buy this particular product. So why did it become a household product now? Why did everyone now use it? Because there was a supply and that created demand. This is like the field of dreams. Right? Anyone, have anyone seen the movie? Right? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, firms exist because firms help satisfy customer wants. We understand that. Uh, business contributes to social welfare. Um, it is difficult to solve a little bit, but we can also rationalize that because, you know, business can contribute to social welfare by providing the goods that people want to buy. So obviously it makes everyone better off by buying those goods, so it can increase social welfare. Um, once we identify the reason why firms exist from a societal perspective, we can now push for the roles that you know, firms play in the, in the, in the, in the community. Uh, they, they have some social responsibility, uh, and this is an ethical issue. And ethics are no longer outside our economic scores. We have to encounter ethical issues many, many times. They have to serve customers, provide employ employment opportunities, and obey law, uh, law and obligate you know, some kind of regulations that is imposed by the government. Each of these will sort of create the social responsibility dimension of our firm. Now, to better understand this, and I think this is the second most important slide of this chapter, to understand the complex decision-making process of a firm, we can use this to sort of get an idea about how complex a firm is. Um, our first three you know, sort of blocks talk about the environment in which or the endowment in which a firm starts, you know, is, is, is at. So their location is influenced by these three things. First of all, these are traditional macroeconomic or even microeconomic variables that affect a firm's production decisions. I mean, production capacity, worker knowledge, communications capacity, research and development, they are all important. Um, the market environment is also an important uh, you know, dimension of the market uh, where customer demand, the level of competition that exists in the market, and the supplier capability all affects a firm's decision to produce, right? So it is like this. Even before a firm thinks about producing something, it has to go through the first three blocks. It has to figure out what the production capacity it has. It has to figure out what kind of knowledge base it has. Is it using new technology or will it be using an old technology? It has to figure out what kind of uh, public relations capacity it has because producing something is not sufficient. If you want to create your demand, you have to supply that and make your consumers know that you have supplied something. right? Right? Okay. So research and development, it has to figure out whether it can invest in research and development. Why is this the first step? This is this is this is not obvious. We understand that before undertaking a production process or making before undertaking a major decision of whether they should produce, these are things that a firm really needs to figure out. Why do a firm need to figure out research and development? from the onset. This is what makes this course a very, very contemporary course. Right? In, yes? I was just going to say, quality, if you have a quality product, it'll kind of find its own research. That's, 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 a, that's a good observation, right? So, um, you know, if a firm really does not have a research and development capacity, chances are that the product that it is selling is of a lower inferior quality, right? But I think we have to spend, you know, emphasize this uh, idea of R&D even more by pointing out that if a firm doesn't have an R&D, 
major sustainability of this firm will be at stake. Because with increased competition, if a firm wants to continue to develop new product and capture larger market share, there has to be huge investment in research and development. The reason why this is a contemporary idea because it is a new idea. It is a new idea. You, some of you might have heard a brand called Ericsson. Anyone familiar with the brand? Two of you. In the 90s, in, during the first generation of uh, you know, mobile phone and, and, uh, and, 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 and mobile phone services, Ericsson was the number one brand. Ericsson is a European uh, brand which had a huge market share in the European mobile market. It also had a very large share in the North American market. My brother used to work for the research and development component of Ericsson. That was a very well respected job. So around the beginning of the second wave of the mobile revolution, which is around 2001-2002, he was flown back to USA. He was started working in Dallas. Within a period of three years, the first thing that Ericsson did it was to shut down the research and development. And within a period of next two or three years, Ericsson filed for bankruptcy. Do you see the connection? So, research and development is like the uh, you know is like the first indicator of the health of a firm. If a firm is investing a lot of money in research and development, you know that the firm is doing well. Okay. Yeah. So did they just become content, or think yeah, that they, they do that? <coughs> Which one? Comparison. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, com it's, it's a complex set of problems. The problems that companies like Sony went through. Sony had a very similar problem. Companies like Motorola went through. Motorola was the number one mobile service providers, if you remember, in the early 90s, right? From there, I mean, think about, uh, you know, BlackBerry, right? They used to be the second largest mobile phone producer. Suddenly, they're obsolete, right? Suddenly, they're obsolete. Why? It could be related to the, you know, the first issues that we talked about, the variability in the profit, the, uh, you know, the two different micro and the macro dimension that we talked about. That obviously provided. So if you think about, so how, where would you want to put Motorola? So why did Motorola fail? Unexpected revenue. Mm, do you think that? I mean, if you are the, you know, the largest producer of mobile services and mobile phones, you know, how would you, uh, you know, get an unexpected dip in your revenue? The market shifts to. I mean, something becomes more popular. So. Right, and, and and I think if you if you want to pick a theory that can explain the fall of Motorola or the fall of Ericsson, I think the compensatory profit theory is more relevant. Right, that in the market suddenly Ericsson mobile phones became obsolete because there were cheaper substitutes. Firms, other firms were making better cell phones with a lower price. Right. It's a very tough world out there. Okay, so so research and development is important, right? Now um, we talked about research and development contributing to the quality of the product. It can also contribute to the cost of the product, right? Through research and development, uh, and I would argue that only through research and development you can actually produce something at a cheaper price than your competitors. So that's uh, technological issues. Now the market environment is obviously, you know, uh, uh, obvious. I'm not gonna, no, I'm not even gonna talk about that. Each of these are central to a firm's uh, decision-making process. Legal environment. This is very interesting. Does a firm care about the legal environment in which it is trying to participate in? The answer should be clearly yes. Right? So let's say you 
are trying to produce some oil related products right some oil related products you are a firm that is thinking about uh, you know producing some goods for which the basic element is the oil which state do you want to have your production plant some coastal state north dakota or texas or missouri where there is no tax uh, where there is no pollution tax right makes sense right i mean so it's quite obvious right a lot of people talk about, I mean, I, 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 did, I did talk about Pittsburgh in the last class, right? Pittsburgh is a classic example when people talk about economics of organization because Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh was at the, at the height of the sort of industrial development that occurred in USA in the early 50s. Within a period of 20 years, Pittsburgh lost half of its population and the city almost got destroyed in the uh, you know from 70s to 80s right in recent times in the last 10 to 15 years you are seeing you know businesses again coming back to pittsburgh so the why right if you do a research you will see that part of this transition is in the legal environment right as a as a regular citizen you might not like the the kind of uh, you know, uh, government policies that individual states undertake, but most of the times they do that to attract customers, to attract business, right? Coastal areas could be an issue, but there are other reasons why you want to switch your business to a more, uh, you know, friendly legal environment, right? So tax burden, regulatory policy, trade policy, all of them are critical, right? All of them are important. Trade policies are, again, a macroeconomic issue, and you guys definitely have uh, been exposed to this idea. Uh, if a country has trade agreements with most of their uh, you know, exporters, then uh, it is easy for firms inside that country to be able to produce that, right? Think about NAFTA, right? So if you, if you are in Mexico uh, and, and, and you are thinking about producing something, what would you want to produce? You want to produce things that you can sell to USA because USA and, Canada and Mexico has a zero uh, tariff policy. If you produce something in Mexico, you can ship it to USA without paying a dime. Right? Makes sense. Okay. Notice that this, after covering these three first three blocks, from now is slowly gearing up in the production process. They are thinking about, once they have satisfied all these, once they have evaluated all these different aspects of their environment that they are in, now they are going to start thinking about product choice. Notice how late this product choice is, right? It is fascinating. Think about it. This is a very complex process. So rather than figure out what the firm will produce, the firm is thinking about the environment, the market, the situation out there, and then thinking about what to produce, right? Are we all clear on this? Are we all clear on why product choice is not the first decision that a firm makes? Product choice is actually quite a late stage decision. Even some would argue that product choice is made simultaneously at the time when pricing strategy is made, because if you want to produce something, you first have to figure out how much price to charge for that. How much price you are going to charge for that is going to come from level of competition. It is going to come from customer demand. So this is a hierarchical table, by the way. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So the decision-making process starts from here, and it goes down there. It's not the other way around. Okay, so after figuring out product choice, figuring out what prices to charge, uh, or, or, or to put it more broadly, we're thinking about a pricing strategy, promotional strategy is important, advertisement is critical here. Notice that advertisement does not actually start from here because you cannot. What you do in the first stage is, is you at least figure out the communication capability, whether you can be, whether you are able to market something, right? Right? Any example of why communication capability is important? 
It has a huge um, part to play in supply chain. It does. How? It's a very, it's a very intuitive, very simple, simple reason. Just of the flow of supply and demand, I guess, in, in that respect, at least. Like being able to see and communicate freely each other's inventory levels or um, when you need something or unexpected changes. Or it creates um, an environment where you can take action faster. Okay, so you, you, part of your answer is correct. So when you think about communication capability, you are thinking about whether firms can communicate with each other. That can also be discussed in terms of how much information is shared between the firms. But communication capability also has to be with the buyers. Now I want to ask a question and I want, to, and I, I want you guys to think about this, right? You are all familiar with different countries having a list of goods that are illegal to produce in that country. I mean, obviously. So uh, that is also an important issue. It, it is obviously part of the legal environment, although it is not mentioned there. So every country has a list of stuff that you cannot produce, right? Right? Think about drugs, right? I mean, when you think about uh, this or this, this is you know very high demand, right? Uh, and and you know if you can really do this underground, you can avoid this, right? Right? So if you want to produce goods that are illegal, you need to have a really good communication capability. Right? Let me tell you a story. And this is the, and the only reason I'm telling you the guys this story is because you guys are taking a more advanced course. I spent four years in Saudi Arabia, which is a country where uh, alcohol consumption is prohibited because of religious grounds and because of government regulations. If you are caught drinking alcohol, you can actually, you know, be hanged. I'm not making this up. Okay? So, what do you expect in a country like that? There should be zero alcohol consumption, right? As it appears, the city that I used to live in, uh, it's like the richest city of that country. It's close to Aramco, which is the oil producing <coughs> company of that country. There was a huge network of oil, oil produ you know, alcohol producing <coughs> sort of firms. And it was entirely underground. Everyone knew about them. And you know, all you had to do was just you know, cross a certain street and get that alcoholic beverage. So how come? I mean. How is it possible that you have a stringent legal environment with very restricted market environment, you are still being able to produce something, you are still being able to communicate the goods to the customers, right? This is fascinating. Anyway, um, promotional strategy is important because you not only have to produce something, you have to promote that. So we understand uh, and so we are, notice also that we are sort of, uh, you know, dividing them into different blocks so that we understand their interplay. They are all connected with each other, by the way. Your technological uh, aspect is each of them are, are related because you, when you think about technology in the old traditional sense, your communication capabilities uh, obviously probably was not part of that, right? If you remember your macro course, Technology was a very blunt thing, right? It was all the large machines that you can produce or the level of knowledge that you can produce. But technology goes beyond that, right? So, com so competitive strategy, and by the way, we are going to be talking about each of these blocks in the future chapters. You probably will, will not recognize that, but each of these blocks will be discussed in specific chapters. So when you think about after covering the first three blocks, figuring out what, where you stand, what kind of markets you are in, uh, what kind of the capacity you have, technology you have available, you figure out your product choice, you figure out your pricing strategy, you figure out your promotional strategy. Three very simple, very straightforward action, decisions you have to make. Now, in traditional economics course, this is where a firm stops. You do not talk about firms anymore. But this is an economics organization which will now take us to how these two blocks of decisions affects our firm's organization. Okay. Are we all clear on this? And this is where we are interested in. Okay. 
We have learned about some of them, or actually all of them from our previous economics courses. Our economics organization will talk about that. So what does it do? Okay. So what or how would the above mentioned decisions affect the organizational design of our firm? Okay. The first thing that has to be important when you are thinking about the organizational design is assignment of decision rights. What does that mean? Meaning that you have to have some managers and you have to have some workers. Some people will make decisions and some people will execute those decisions. There can be several layers of managers where some managers will make decisions and some managers will convey those decisions to the workers. But there has to be a structure. Right? Makes sense. Makes sense. So the assignment of decision right is critical to the organizational design of a firm. Two, match worker incentives with managerial motives. What does that mean? Match worker incentives with managerial motives. Meaning that in order to get something from your workers, you have to also give them something. The role of people who are inside that firm is well defined, right? There are, as I mentioned, that there are managers who make decisions and there are workers who does the work, right? You could have a situation where what the manager wants is not executed by the worker or what the worker wants is not given by the manager. The outcome is shutdown, inefficiency, right? So in order to have an efficient firm, you need to have a good communication between the manager and the worker. How do you do that? By giving what both of them wants. A manager wants a higher production, a worker wants better incentives. Salaries, you know, health insurance, off times, you know, lunch facilities, childcare facilities, right? All of them are important inside the organization of a firm. Okay, the last one is kind of separate and, and, and we want to be careful about why this is different from that. The last part is say design, decision management and control. Decision management and control. What do we understand about decision management and control? Any, any, any thought on this? Mm -hmm. Just to make sure that it follows the right path and there's not too much decision based on one person, a decision. Okay. That makes sense. Let's start a, a, a couple of steps, steps back. Who, who makes these decisions, by the way? Assignment of responsibility, uh, matching the incentives of the firm, you know, management, managers with the workers. Who makes these decisions? There are three answers. Very interesting. All of them are the same thing, by the way. We are kind of blunt in economics in the sense that sometimes we really do not use fancy words, right? Um, it could be different layers of the managers where some managers make decisions and some execute those decisions, right? You can think about a production manager who really takes orders from a manager who is in the human resource development or in an upper level executive, right? We can also bundle them and we can say that it's the owner who makes the decisions, right? The idea of ownership of a firm is complicated. I understand that and you should, you also understand that. We're going to talk about the ownership later when we talk about different kind of firm's decisions. For the time being, if we think about them as owners, they can assign decision rights. They probably will... Uh, you know, if they are uh, smart and efficient, they are going to execute number two. They will definitely execute number three. Decision management and control. Control is very important. Because a lot of people are going to be part of the second stage because there are a lot of workers, many, many firm managers. Few people will be on the assignment of decision rights, few executives. Control is usually one or very few. Are we all clear on, clear on that? Like a board of directors, which consists of very sim, very small number of people. So, um, if some of you, you know, will take MBA level, you know, will part, if some of you pursue MBA degree, 
there they will talk about this sort of like the structure of a firm where the far, you know the structure is sort of like like a pyramid shape right there are very few people at the top as you go down there are more and more people in different layers and that is usually a stereotypical organization of a firm let's take a moment to take questions any questions about this very critical slide that connects the different stages of decision making process by a firm in a very very clearly uh, clear cut hierarchical way let me try to ask some questions please do not be offended i just want to understand whether you understand this right why why cannot you assign decision rights without figuring out product choice because you, you don't know what decisions you need to be made absolutely choices you have right are we all clear on that so this one has to come after all these right you if you do not know what kind of promotion strategies you are going to have you really do not know how many uh, you know peer group people you are going to hire or how or how many people are supposed to be just looking at the advertisement of the of the firm right then because assignment of decision rights also will involve who is going to do what right not everyone does same thing in a firm makes sense um why cannot you match worker incentives with managerial motives by using the legal environment can the government not force the firms to pay uh, the incentives that the government believes the workers are entitled to uh, am i clear on the question so you will see sometimes the government will say that well let's raise the minimum wage from 5 dollar to 70 dollar per hour right if the government has a policy it is going to come here the legal act environment that will directly affect this right the incentives of the workers does that mean that this decision can be taken here the answer is no why are we all clear on the question why is that why why is whenever the government imposes something on the economy in the legal environment cannot automatically determine this yes because you have to know what your like based on your prices you can determine your profit margin and or how much you have to spend on worker incentives incentives or on um, you just have to know what you're even working with first with your product okay good. yeah so that's a good a very good answer i'm going to come back to that you're not motivating the workers at all in that you're giving them something you are you saying that if the government gives them this subsidy or this raises the minimum wage then they'll have to do what the managers want them to do no i didn't ask that i see I, I, my my question was a open question so if this the government raises the minimum wage from 5 dollar to 70 dollar which is a huge increase in the wages obviously the incentives of the workers have gone up right how will that another very important point very important point two very important point raised by you i'm going to come back to that to those in a minute so if the minimum wage is raised does that mean that this decision has already been made here notice we are saying that this is a hierarchical decision decision tree where these decisions are they are taken first this decision is taken for second and then this affects these two decisions affect this are we all clear on that okay so two very interesting answers i'm going to come back to that in a minute i want to i want to ask one more question where is production decision taking place which is the most important which is the core of a farm then a farm is a production unit it produces right where do you see production decision taking place 
It should be obvious, but sometimes we do not see the obvious thing. No? No? It's in the middle, right? It is, it is here where the production decision is taking place. So even if the government raises a minimum wages from $5 to $70, that really uh, you know, does not solve your organizational problem. Why? Because you might not design to produce at all. Number one. That means raising your minimum wage from $70 to uh, $5 to $70 really does not increase the incentives of the worker because they will be unemployed. Are we all clear on that? If you remember your principles on macro, we sort of shed a light on this idea in a very different setup where we said that increasing minimum wage creates unemployment. Remember that? Okay. Okay. See, when we say match worker incentives with managerial motives, like for example, um, banks will have their teller employees write thinking cards to send out to um, uh, customers, and they'll get a fifty-dollar bonus for doing that. This is a very important point, um, and in due time, we're going to talk about not only that, but also the various strategies that the firm undertakes to match the worker incentives with the managerial motives. This is not, this is just the one aspect. We are going to talk about the efficiency wage theory, where the wage that is being provided to the worker is not the only incentive that he gets. He might get, let's say, uh, a one day of the week where he does not have to uh, dress formally, like what I'm doing right now. I usually wear formal dress in my classes, but in the summer I am free. Right? This is a big incentive for me. Okay, we're gonna talk about that. That's a very important point. Thanks for raising that. So we're done with chapter one. Uh, talks about the structure of the text, let's just ignore that. And and uh, if you don't have any further question, I would like to start the more serious chapter of this course, the second chapter. The second chapter is serious in the sense that we are going to start looking at more empirical issues in chapter 2. Chapter 2 is very tightly knitted, a lot of computations, although uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the class, I am not going to talk about the empirical aspect of this chapter. Today we are going to do a very basic introduction of chapter 2 where we are going to look at some of the things that we have already seen as like how to calculate, how to uh, you know, get an equilibrium price, how to maximize profit. But we looked at that in our principal level courses from a graphical perspective. Then in your intermediate mic microeconomics, you probably looked at that from a numerical perspective. In this chapter, we are going to look at it from an empirical perspective, where we are going to give you data, actual data, and you will be required to calculate profit made by firms. So that's what we're going to do in the next class tomorrow. Um, chapter 2 is very, very important. Because chapter 2 is going to introduce all the stuff about economics that you hate, which is math, more math, and step. We are in, uh, so uh, the reason why we are going to spend some significant time trying to understand the mathematical, uh, numerical, and the empirical aspects of economics is because we want to make this course as operationalized as, as possible. We want to help the students so that they can take this course and learn something that they can apply to real economy, real life. And the only way to do that is to understand the uh, you know the mathematical, the mathematics and the statistics behind some of the economic theory. So we usually formalize that by talking about economic optimization. Optimization can be uh, a different kind of decision that takes place in economic organizations. Uh, you have heard about optimization in a very different aspect. For example, profit maximization is an optimization where firms try to maximize their profit. You probably have heard about cost minimization, which is also an optimization where firms try to minimize their cost. So all these are based on the same kind of mathematical, you know, mathematical principle where 
you know, you probably have seen the, the use of tangency principle in your pre-intermediate. You guys have seen the tangency conditions, right, in your intermediate microeconomics, where the tangency between certain, you know, uh, cost functions can uh, help you to identify cost minimization. And we're going to sort of revisit some of them. We're going to start with thinking about economic optimization process. Uh, how, how, you know, obviously eco economics is all about optimization because optimization can give you the equilibrium. Through optimization, you reach an equilibrium. Either equilibrium in the goods and services market, either equilibrium in the labor market, every equilibrium is achieved through an optimization process. The idea behind economic optimization process is fairly new. It's, it might surprise you to know that most of the economic theory that we are covering right now were mainly developed in about 100, 150 years ago by uh, people like Marshall, uh, by people like Cournot, by people like Nash. But the, the modern version of economics of organization that we are looking at is actually quite recent because part of the math and the statistical technology that has been used in the form of optimization process is fairly new. Is there anyone here who has some kind of Russian background? Okay, so economics thanks uh, a series of Russian economists to develop the set of sort of optimization process that we are going to look at. Okay, we are going to look at revenue relations. We are looking. We are going to look at cost relations. We are going to look at profit relations, and then we are going to see how we can expose them uh, by using various mathematical tools, and how these mathematical tools can help us to do the optimization process. So what we are literally going to show is we are going to look at profit maximization, we are going to look at cost minimizations. Due to the time that I have today, probably I'll be able to cover just the profit maximization. Uh, in the next class, we will start with the cost minimization part. Uh, a lot of words that are going to be you know, uh, discussed in this chapter, let me just skip that, plus, you know, but please take a look at it on your, uh, at your leisure. Okay, so what is an economic or, or optimization process? So we, uh, let's start with the definition. Optimal decisions are best decisions, uh, you know, produces the result most consistent with managerial objective. This is a very uh, uh, interesting uh, answer, and I really like this uh, definition. So our optimization, optim optimal decision are decisions that doesn't necessarily maximize your profit or minimize your cost, but that is consistent with what you want. So what you want is very important. Sometimes you might want to maximize your sales rather than maximize your profit or minimize your cost. Then your optimal decision would be to do stuff that can maximize your revenue or sales. Now, most of the economists argue at least people who, do, who does research on the economics of organization, argue that one of the main objective of a firm is not to maximize profit, not to minimize cost, but to maximize the value of the firm. The maximize the value of the firm is a kind of confusing, uh, uh, you know, confusing concept, right? So what is the value of a firm to begin with? How do you measure the value of a firm? Right. That's one way to think about the value of a firm. Some people say that the market capitalization of a firm is the value of a firm. Mm -hmm. Right? If you want, yes. Some people would say that well, if a firm is you know has a very well satisfied customers or they have a very you know renowned brand, that is also a value of a firm, right? Track record or goodwill or things like that, they could all be part of this, you know, elusive thing called the value of a firm, right? 
We are going to skip all those. We are going to say that the value of a firm is the liter, uh, total monetary value of the firm. So we are going to be a little bit, uh, you know, narrow-minded and say that the value of a firm is the sort of the revenue stream that the firm generates, right? Uh, and we can maximize the value of a firm by, uh, by producing what the customers want, obviously. The more the customer buys, the more we can sell. And meet customer needs efficiently, that's also connected at the same time. But how do you meet customers' need efficiently? What does that mean? You, 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 you are all exposed to this idea of efficiency. What is efficiency? How can a firm achieve efficiency? Doesn't it kind of come back to the compensatory theory, where it's better? It does. It does come back to the compensatory theory. It does. But we want to sort of generalize that idea. How do you achieve efficiency? Right. So that is consistent with what you what you just said. So you can, if you can have a, 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 a strategy or a way to minimize your cost, you can create the variability of profit. You can really raise your profit, uh, provided that you have the same stream of revenue, right? So revenue minus total cost, if cost goes down, uh, you can get profit. But in economics, for reasons that I really do not know, because I am not a microeconomist, efficiency and profit maximization are not the same thing. Ach achieving efficiency and achieving the maximum amount of profit are not the same thing. So we want to separate that from the onset. We are going to th talk about three different things in this chapter. We are going to talk about profit maximization, where the firm is only interested in maximizing the gap between total revenue and total cost. Then we are going to talk about sales maximization, where the firm is mainly trying to maximize the amount of sale that they can do, which depends on their total revenue. Finally, we are going to talk about efficiency of a firm which will be mainly to think about how a firm can minimize their cost. A critical question that we are going to encounter, and this will be in your exam, is, is it possible for a firm, I mean, uh, I, want, I want to say, state the statement twice, is it possible for a firm to achieve all of them at the same time? Achieve profit maximization, achieve cost minimization, and achieve sales maximization at the same time at the same level of output? The answer is no. The answer is no. And we'll see why. Wouldn't cost minimization, or wouldn't profit maximization imply <coughs> cost minimization? In our economics, it will. <clears throat> but when you think about the two competing profit theories that we talked about, a minimum cost does not necessarily guarantee the maximum level of profit because... Yeah, but the other way around, though, is that... Well, not necessarily. Uh, let's think about two firms. One firm is a high cost... So think about GM versus Toyota. Right? GM being a high cost firm, Toyota being a low cost firm, but when you compare their profit numbers, they are pretty com comparable now these days. But if one firm could lower its cost more than it already is, then it would make more profit. So the profit is not an excellent level. Uh, think about the profit of firm one, profit of firm two, right? Total revenue one, total cost one, total revenue two, total cost two. What you are saying is that what if they have the same total revenue, and if this guy has a lower cost, he automatically has a higher profit, right? Obviously makes sense. But are their profit total revenue the same? No. We are starting from the onset that they are making different levels of output decisions. They are different firms of different size. They have variability in their profit. Right? Well, I was just thinking more along the lines of the same firm, right. but they can lower their costs. They can, they can increase their profit, true, but does that necessarily guarantee that they can maximize their profit? So. Let's imagine that you are thinking about just one firm, right? And you are saying that 
keeping my total revenue the same, keeping my total revenue the same, if I reduce my total cost, I can obviously maximize my profit. Right? If you have maximized your profit, then you have lowered your costs as low as they can go. While still holding the same. Let's amount. wait. Let's wait for that idea. Uh, okay, the point well taken. We are going to look at this from a graphical perspective. Okay, okay. Good, good point. Um, let's, before looking at the you know, more serious issues, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure you have heard this debate between greed versus self interest. Uh, if you remember Wall Street, it says greed is good, right? Uh, for a firm, greed is good because they want to, if they want to, uh, you know, produce more, they want, if they want to make more profit, uh, it's, it's, it's a good motivation for a firm, right? What is self-interest? Self-interest is to, you know, uh, acquire as much profit as for yourself. So, greed and self-interest are connected. If you have self-interest, you are greedy, right? Do they work out well when you have self-interest and you are greedy? Um... I think this is where I think the book dangerously crosses a line between normative and positive economics. And the uh, author sort of leans towards the normative side without providing any sufficient empirical evidence. And he argues that probably they are contradictory. They are uh, self-destructive in the sense that when you have self-indulgence, when you have a self-interest, when you only care about yourself, care about your own profit, it leads to failure. Because by trying to maximize your profit, you do not pay attention to everyone who is involved in the production process. You do not pay your workers enough, you don't uh, give enough holidays to your managers, everyone is unhappy. So what happens is that in the short run you have profit, in the long run you are doomed. Right? That's what he's thinking. And his idea is from sort of like a normative perspective. He's trying to argue that this is unethical. I don't know. This, uh, yeah. Because the customers see you badly and so they don't really trust you or the product, I guess, in a certain way. Well, that's one side of the story. That's another very important point. This economics of organization course is so complex because there are two sides of the story. One side is the is the impression side to the consumer. The other side, we are, we are talking about the industrial organizational side, right? So you can have the best product in the world and you can have, uh, you know, probably a very competitive price. You can have a market, but if there are so much mismanagement related problem in your, inside your firm, you really cannot sustain. I mean, GM is a classic example again, right? Well, like isn't the marketing strategy for a lot of companies now is to appear kind of like fun and bubbly. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and absolutely. So having that image it is, does. Is, is a strategy itself. It is a strategy, but it, it, is, it is not a self-indulgent strategy, by the way. Well, you can be hypocritical and you can say that it is. Like Warren Buffett giving out half of his wealth mm -hmm. cannot be, uh, you know, entirely philosophic, you know, philanthropic. Mm -hmm. and there is a self-indulgence there. Uh, let's not go there. I, I'm not comfortable with this particular discussion because it's, I, don't, I don't think the debate is well founded or well defined. But all, I think anything, everything that you are saying uh, is important, right? The author is saying that uh, self-indulgence is bad and the business should always have a customer focus. We all know that this is not the case all the time, right? Market power can dictate how much customer you actually care, right? Uh, if you think about the customer service that Verizon is to provide five years ago and the customer service that Verizon provides now, you see remarkable difference, right? Are we all, are, are you all with me on this? I mean, customers in and of themselves are like, are self-indulgent and or, you know, I guess kind of, if you, from next, anyway, never mind, yes. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, we have like uh, 10 minutes in that. I think we can st uh, st start the process, the numerical process. So we all are familiar with how the revenue is calculated. This is uh, rudimentary ideas. Revenue is price times quantity. You have seen uh, discussions about marginal revenue uh, in your other courses. Marginal revenue is the change in total revenue that arises from selling extra output. Uh, revenue maximization is where the output is maximum. So this is where you can maximize your sales. 
right? So, if you remember your intermediate microeconomics, uh, revenue will be maximized when the marginal revenue is zero, right? Because your total revenue curve is like going up, up, and up, then it starts going down. Uh, so, uh, let's start putting that into perspective, right? Do you all know how a total revenue curve looks like? Oh, a total revenue curve almost mimics a total product curve, right? It's usually like that. Why? So this is quantity. And as you sell more quantity initially, your total revenue increases after that it goes down. Why is that? Returns. Mm. Diminishing returns? This is not cost. When we talk about cost, we talk about diminishing returns. Because you won't be able to sell that quantity at the highest price. Very good. Very good. And, and this discussion was very um, uh, inefficiently discussed in principles of microeconomics and macroeconomics, where we try to uh, talk about how elasticity of the demand curve affects the total revenue. And when we talked about two different forces that affect total revenue, the price effect and the quantity effect, right? So one of the argument is that if you try to sell more output, you really have to lower price. As a result, your total revenue might actually go down when you are producing more and selling more, right? And this could be one of the classical examples. Should what? there be price on the y-axis? Uh, this is all measured in dollars, right? So this is price, this is total revenue, all of them, right? You're right. But here we are measuring total revenue. So these are dollar measurement, this is quantity measurement. So that's how. Um, so if this is the case, this is where your profit your total revenue is maximized. Um, if you have done the marginal revenue calculations, how does the marginal revenue curve look like for this kind of total revenue? I should be, I should be more careful about this one. Um, I didn't do it right, so that's why you guys think you guys are confused. So it's gonna be like that and like that. Right? If that is total revenue, how does my total margin revenue look like? It's the opposite, opposite side, right? Like it's gonna be like that. And in order to be very careful, my margin revenue curve is going to become zero when my total revenue is maximum. How do we know that? Because in your intermediate microeconomics, you know that this marginal revenue is nothing but the slope of the total revenue curve at different points, right? So the incremental changes here is, is, is captured by marginal revenue. So when the total revenue curve increases, my, uh, but it increases a decreasing rate, so this is there is a concavity there. Uh, and as, marginal, as total revenue increases at a decreasing rate, your marginal revenue starts going down. When the total revenue is maximum, at that point, we call it a global maximum, where it is at the top of the building, and that at the top of that building, the curve is kind of relatively flat. And at that flat part, your marginal revenue is zero. There are more important, more economic reasons why the marginal revenue is going to be zero when total revenue is maximum. What is that? How do we know for sure that this is where the, mar the marginal, uh, this is where the marginal revenue is going to be zero, at point A and at point A? <coughs> That's at the point where marginal cost equals marginal. Cost. There is no discussion about marginal cost here. It's not efficient to operate. Mm, very good, very good. So let's think about the, the output level. Let's say this is Q1. So let's think about this part and let's think about this part. So you, in this part where total revenue is increasing, right, the more you sell, the more revenue you get, would you want to stop your production in this part? You don't, right? In this part, as you produce more, your total revenue is going down. There is no reason to produce. Why? Cost you more than there is no cost discussions here. Uh, 
I haven't really drawn any cost curves here. Why would you not wanna produce in this? I, I apologize. I have asked my wrong question. I apologize. Your your answer is right. I haven't. Well, yeah, you, we, I should have asked this question after I have drawn the total cost curve. I apologize. I've been teaching for a long time to this. Um, how do we know that margin? So the correct question would have been: How do we know total revenue uh, at point A also corresponds to a zero marginal revenue? The idea is that when you are at this part on the total revenue where raising output is also raising your total revenue, your marginal revenue is positive, right? It's going down, but it is positive. After that, when total revenue is curve is going down, it means that adding each additional number of output is going to make your marginal revenue negative. So in this part, do you all see that? So in this part, the marginal revenue curve is actually below the zero axis, and it's negative. So between a positive marginal revenue and a negative marginal revenue lies the point where marginal revenue is zero. And that corresponds to the maximum level of total revenue. So if you're a firm that really loves to maximize their sales, this is where you want to produce, at Q1. So for you, your profit, ma your sales maximization or revenue maximization equilibrium condition would be to produce where marginal revenue is equal to zero. We're going to start uh, conclude our class today by raising the last question. Let's take the question and think about it before looking at the answer. Do firms really optimize? We're going to look at three different kind of optimization behavior by our firm. So revenue maximization, profit maximization, and cost minimization. They are three different kind of optimizing behavior. Do firms actually do that in reality? The answer is no, they cannot. And we want to be aware of that because you have every firm living in a under undergoing every uh, at least some kind of inefficiency or waste management or some kind of management problem that really uh, prevents the firm from achieving their goals. Okay. The goal of profit maximization, the goal of sales maximization, or the goal of cost minimization. So in reality, it is very hard to optimize. Now. Let me ask the last question of the class. If somebody asks you to choose between these three optimization behavior and ask you which one would be reachable or which one would be easy to achieve, which one would you uh, go for? Which one do you think is easier to achieve? Revenue maximization, profit maximization, or cost minimization? Revenue is easier to control. It is. Cost. Right? Cost is easier to control. Right. This is how we, uh, and that's a very good answer, right? At the beginning of today's class, we talked about this, right? We said that when we teach production theory or theory of the firm in our principles of macro, we, make, we, make, we seem to make it look like the firms can control their cost. They are kind of dependent on the market about the revenue. In reality, it's the other way around, by the way, right? In reality, it is, more, it is easier to control your revenue rather than your cost because costs are uncertain. Are we all clear on that? So costs are very difficult to control and minimize because they are uncertain. If costs are that difficult to control, profits are also quite difficult to maximize, right? Because one component of that profit maximization is cost. The easiest one is to maximize total revenue. Because all you have to care about is how much you can sell. Right? Which itself is a complicated decision, by the way. Thank you very much. I just like said thank you, so I Uh, my girl. You like to
I like Norway discussions, but not in the context of uh, economic organization. I like normative questions in the context of a macroeconomic. Do I think normative questions are better, uh, you know, under 